serving as the executive sponsor of the CMS Federal Women's Group, uh, which is in the Employee Resource Group here at CMS, with the mission of ensuring that women are fully represented in CMS recruitment, hiring, promotion, and retention efforts. We're here this afternoon to celebrate Women's History Month. Women's His History Month is celebrated each March in the United States and was first celebrated nationally in 1981 when Congress passed Public Law 97-28. This law authorized and requested that the President proclaim the week of March 7th 1982 as Women's History Week. In 1987, and after being continuously petitioned by the National Women's History Project, Congress passed Public Law 100-9, which designated the entire month of March as Women's History Month. Women's History Month seeks to highlight the contributions of women through such movements as the women's suffrage movement, women's right to work, women's right to equal pay, and the Me Too movement, which have collectively really helped to shape our country. Accounts of the lives of individual women are critically important because they highlight exceptionally strong role models who expand the vision of what women can achieve. The stories of women's lives and the choices they have made have encouraged younger women and have provided the nation with a richer understanding of the female experience. But this is not just something celebrated in the United States. Last Sunday, we also recognized International Women's Day. Uh, International Women's Day is a companion to Women's History Month and is celebrated annually on the 8th of March. International Women's Day has been observed since the early 1900s and is globally recognized as a day to celebrate the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements of women around the world. International Women's Day also serves as a call to action for accelerating gender parity. The celebration is not specific to a country, a group, or an organization. It belongs to everyone, everywhere. The 2020 celebration is most notable here in the United States because it also marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution for the United States, which provided suffrage for women and gave all women the right to vote in this country. So think about what has been accomplished over those 100 years? We have leading women in all walks of life, from prominent presidential candidates to administrators of this very agency. We have put women into space and provided them equal standing in our military, and we have found our stride in the workplace and every day as we move closer and closer to shattering that glass ceiling. And at CMS, women have accomplished so much due to the consistent perseverance demonstrated by the women at CMS on a day-to-day -day basis. The strength and determination that you show by all of the work that you do every single day benefits hundreds of millions 
of beneficiaries that we serve each day. So as we observe women's history today, I just ask that you take time to reflect on those women who have come before us and the women who will follow us. Ask yourself what legacy will we leave these vigilant women of the vote? So I would, I would like to turn the program over now to Anita Pinder, who is the director of the Office of Equal Employment and Civil Rights. Anita. Thanks, Nancy. Again, I'm Anita Pender, Director of the Office of Equal Opportunity and Civil Rights, and glad to be here with you today. Uh, thanks for those who are able to join us in person and those who are joining us um, you know, around the country uh, via the remote uh, options. So each year, uh, we celebrate Women's History Month. And like all of our observances, it's just an opportunity to take a few moments out of our time to uh, pay attention to and highlight contributions uh, of different segments of society. So for March, one of those segments of society uh, is to recognize the achievement of uh, women and the important contributions they've made that really uh, make a difference in our lives uh, today. And so <clears throat> while we're waiting on um, our speaker to join us, I'll also share a, a bit about some uh, honorees um, and again highlight some of their contributions. <clears throat> So each year, the National Women's History Alliance creates a theme for uh, Women's History Month. And this year, the theme, and you've seen it in our advertisement and what's displayed, is valiant women of the vote. Again, calling attention to those important contributions. So they give, in addition to coming up with the theme, each year they also honor a number of women for their uh, contributions uh, to uh, the American society. So this theme celebrates the women who have fought for women's right to vote in the United States. In recognition of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, uh, we will honor uh, some of the women suffrage, uh, suffragists uh, as well. So I'll just mention a few from um, history and then also mention a few of some names you might actually know from some present day uh, honorees. So uh, Lucy Burns, uh, she was American uh, suffragist. Um, she was born in uh, 1879 uh, and worked tirelessly until uh, 1966. She was noted uh, for being co-founder for the National Women's Party alongside Alice Paul. And she was again one of those silent um, sentinels who picked at the White House during World War I, again demanding the right to vote for women. Uh, this name I know, I'm, I've heard this one, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt, uh, American uh, suffragist uh, as well. And again, she worked on the national level also to again win the right for women to vote. She worked with politicians at the state and national level, including Woodrow Wilson, who at the time did not support uh, women's suffrage. Uh, however, by 1918, Wilson was in support and, uh, led to, and this led to passing the 19th Amendment in 1920. And sometimes I think it's just easy to lose sight when we already have rights and certain liberties of just what the battle was like historically to get us to this point. Uh, also, Anna Roque Dupree, again, and she was co-founder of the University of Puerto Rico. And so in, 19, uh, in 1893, uh, she helped, again, found Puerto Rico's first feminist newspaper. And I'm so glad I used Duolingo a few months ago so I can say, La Mujer, which is, and that's probably stuff, still murdered it, but that's woman. <laughs> So she was considered one of Puerto Rico's strongest advocates for women's suffrage. She was one of the founders of the Puerto, Rica, Puerto Rican Feminist League and utilized her talents as a writer to gain public support, again, for this cause. Uh, she uh, also helped found the Puerto Rican Association for Suffragist Women, and this group again successfully lobbied the voting rights for uh, women, and this was achieved in uh, 1929. Again, she went on to create um, the Island Association of Voting Women. Um, in terms of, uh, I'll share just a couple more, and then we'll, again, some names you might uh, recall. Uh, so Elizabeth Piper Ensley, she was an educator and African-American suffrage 
fist. Uh, she was a champion for the women's suffrage movement and became a leader in civil rights uh, activism. After a move to Colorado, she became a reporter for the Women's Era, and this is a newsletter that is affiliated with the National Association of Colored Women. And even though women in Colorado won the right to vote in 1893, suffragists continued to push for, national, uh, women for the National Women's Suffrage uh, Amendment. And again, her goal was to educate women of color on how to vote and why they should vote. Um, and again, as you can see, the themes we're still working with uh, in the, the present day. She co-founded the Colored Women's Republic uh, Club, and she also served as second vice president of the Colorado State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, which organized and again mobilized suffrage movement uh, activities. Uh, and the final sort of historical perspective I'll share, and that's Marie Foster. She was a civil rights leader, and again, she worked very closely with Dr. Martin Luther King and other civil rights leader in Alabama to secure the right to vote uh, for African Americans. Uh, it's noted that on Sunday, March 7th, 1965, a nonviolent voting march was scheduled uh, to uh, take place in Selma, uh, Alabama, I mean Selma to Montgomery. The 600 mar marchers got only as far, again, as the Edmund Pettus Bridge when the state and local lawmen uh, attack marchers again with clubs and tear gas. Again, if we know from our history, we may have seen um, depictions of that in movies and accounts uh, on uh, the news. And Foster was one of those marchers, and because of uh, some of the brutality she suffered, she came to embody the challenges that protesters faced. And so two weeks later, um, she walked 50 miles in five days as part of the voting rights march from Selma to Montgomery. She tried to register to vote eight times before she was ultimately successful, again, again demonstrating the perseverance um, that was uh, often displayed uh, during this time in history. Following this experience, she started uh, teaching other African Americans how to pass a voting test um, so that they could, again, vote. So each year, like I mentioned, the Alliance also recognizes women of the current day. And so I'll just share a couple of those with you. Marie Teresa Kumar, and she's CEO of Voto Latino. So I had shakes, so maybe they, uh, someone uh, does recognize. She was born in Bogota, Colombia, and grew up in Sonoma, California. She attended college at Harvard's Kennedy uh, University School of Government and the University of uh, California, Davis. She began, began her political career as a legislative aide and uh, served as a Democratic caucus chair. She's the founding president and CEO of Voto Latino, a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, organization, again, that works uh, to encourage and educate young Hispanics and Latino voters, again, helping people to vote and to just learn the ins and outs uh, of the system. Again, how to become uh, just more politically aware of issues affecting the community. They have registered, Voto Latino has registered over a quarter million voters and has played an influential role in national elections. And so she has, again, continued to work and received many awards uh, for her efforts. She also works as a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, an Aspen Institute Scholar, a Hunt Alternative Fund Prime Mover, and serves on the Council of Foreign Relations uh, uh, as a lifetime member. And so, again, that's uh, some current activity. We also have, again, a name you might uh, recall, Eleanor uh, Holmes, who's a civil rights leader and uh, congressperson. She's also been a political organizer, and she currently serves as the Congressional Representative District of Columbia. Uh, she attended Yale University, where she mastered in American Studies, and she graduated in 1963. The following year, she moved to Philadelphia, where she worked as a clerk for a federal judge and she's also worked for the American Civil Liberties uh, Union. Uh, during her time at ACLU, she uh, represented uh, many individuals specializing in freedom of speech issues. Again, things that also really connect to the whole issue around the women's right to vote. Uh, during her long uh, legal career, she's represented Vietnam uh, war protesters, civil rights advocates, politicians, feminists, really just the whole gamut. 
Um, she is currently in her 15th term as congressperson and has implemented many, many laws that protect uh, the citizens living in her uh, district. And so again, you'll see uh, just that one that we just have this uh, uh, observance that the, the need for this continues as we're still uh, working on many fronts uh, to reach a level of uh, parity and equality in many aspects, so be it uh, in, for some uh, individuals, be it in the workplace, uh, in society, that there's still work to be done. And so we're happy um, today that we'll be able to spend some time um, and hearing from someone who can share a bit about her experience. And so as I give her a few more minutes to get to the stage, I'll share uh, one more. Uh, and it's funny, like you never know how you're gonna connect with things. So as we were preparing for this and we learned about Edith uh, Mayo, who's a historian and uh, activist, and she actually, um, uh, works at the um, National Museum of American uh, History. And so we had a, a colleague who actually worked in our office and actually uh, went to that organization. So at some point when we were, you know, uh, researching different uh, speakers or things we can highlight, we actually were able to call over there and say, like, do you know Miss Mayo? You know, what can you tell us about her? And so maybe that's my version of six degrees of separation from somebody who's famous. And so again, she's a historian uh, of the women's suffrage movement as well as, a, as an activist. She's the current curator at the, uh, for political history in the National Museum of American uh, History. In March 2015, she was honored by the Fairfax County uh, Board of Supervisors for her service uh, in that role. And again, this is part of the Smithsonian. And so, you know, again, just even knowing somebody who's connected to the Smithsonian uh, was a joy. Uh, she is also the author of many academic articles and books, including First Ladies, Political Roles, and Public uh, Image. And she currently contributes to the Turning Point uh, Memorial, where documents, again, on the history of African American leaders in the suffrage uh, movement. And has worked, again, her work has contributed to increasing public recognition for public contributions of African American suffragists. And so, again, just uh, even an example that's sort of close to home right down the road in Washington, D.C. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our speaker for the remaining of our time here this uh, morning. And that is Dr. Constant, uh, Constance Bales, uh, PhD. She holds a degree in sociology and a master's degree in adult education and a PhD in group dynamics, organizational development, and, psycho and psychological studies from Temple University. Uh, her doctoral dissertation uh, focused uh, on the areas of communication and skill development, group dynamics, and prevention of sexual harassment in the workplace. Noted for her many years of achievement, Dr. Bales has been awarded numerous certificates of accomplishment and appreciation, and those include uh, the Federal Woman of the Year Award, the Federal Government's Bronze Medal for Outstanding Public Service, and the Federal Government Outstanding Leadership Award, again, among many others. She's a lifetime member of the Federal Employed Employed Women's Association, uh, Federal Executive, a Senior Executive Service, and Federal Managers Association. And she's also a member of the National Association for the Advancement of Color People. Dr. Bales is a certified True Colors self-assessment facilitator, and she is currently the Executive Director of Renaissance Counseling, Training, and Consultant Service. Her uh, skilled expertise includes the facilitation of uh, several self-enhancement instruments, again, and team building assessments, again, just to uh, increase the effectiveness of, of our population. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Bales. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you all for having me. I really do appreciate the opportunity. Uh, sorry for the little delay, but security here is over the top. Uh, I mean, look here. <laughs> I told this guy, you need another job. This is just too much for me. But anyway, I'm here, and I'm, I'm grateful. But I'm, technically, I was on time, because I was out there at 10 minutes of, and they... <laughs> but anyway, in light of your theme, talking about women's equality, uh, I'm going to give you just a little bit of history about how that all came about. And more importantly, I want to talk to you about where women are today in government. 
I too have worked for the federal government. I retired with 37 years of service as the senior executive service. And I'm sure some of you here and some of you remotely are aspiring to be those things. And sometimes you gotta figure out, if you wanna know where you're going, you need to find somebody that has traveled that road. You know, talking to people all the time about what you don't have and what you haven't done, and neither have they, usually doesn't get you the accomplishments that you're actually trying for. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but first of all, let's talk about women's suffrage because you, know, you need to know where we started to know where we are and you also want to know where you're going. The women's suffrage mo movement just celebrated its 100th anniversary. 100 years ago on June 4th, 1919, women in the United States won the right to vote. It would be another year after that before the bill was ratified by Congress on August 26th of 1920. August 18th of 1920 marked the anniversary of the ratification. It was the 19th Amendment. Why is it important? It's important because it gave some women the right to vote. I say some because it was not until 1965 that African American women were given the same loop to freedom for, to exercise their rights. The 19th Amendment was important because it was the victorious conclusion of the decade-long suffrage and struggles of women to earn that right to vote. Nearly 100 years ago, women around the U.S. protested, picketed, and were imprisoned to secure their constitutional rights to vote. Today, only 19.6% of elected officials in Congress are women. And during the 2016 presidential election, one in every three women eligible to vote did not cast a ballot. But we can proudly say that we stand on the shoulders of the brave and the brilliant sufferers who we honor their legacy and continue the unfinished business by creating a more equal and just society. African American women actually got the right to vote before women did legally. Black women got the right to vote in the 1920s, but before that, they could not vote. Therefore, the 20s, they wouldn't allow them to vote based on racism and, and intimidation. But Equal Rights Today is celebrated in the United States on August 26th to commemorate that 19th Amendment, which prohibits the states and the federal government from denying the right of citizens to vote in the United States based on sex. It was first celebrated in 1973 and is proclaimed each year in the United States by by United States presidents. The date was chosen to commemorate that day in 1920 when Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby signed the proclamation granting American women the constitutional right to vote. In 1971, following the 1970 nationwide women's strike for equality, and again in 1973 as the battle over the Equal Rights Amendment continued, Congresswoman Bella Isaiah of New York introduced a resolution to designate August 26th as Women Equality Day. On August 16th of 1973, Congress approved the ratification, which stated that on August 23 would be the designated as Women's Equality Day and that the president is authorized to request to, to issue a proclamation in commemoration of that day. In 1920, on which the women in America were first granted the right to vote, the same day, President Richard Nixon issued a proclamation for Women's Equality Day, which began in part the struggle for women's suffrage. However, only the first step toward full equality, participation of women in the nation's life. In recent years, we have made other giant strides by attacking sex discrimination through our laws and by paving new avenues of equality, economic opportunity for women. Today, in virtually every sector of our society, women are making important contributions to the quality of American life, and yet much still remains to be done. As of, 19, as of 2018, every president since Richard Nixon has issued a proclamation designating August 26th as Women's Equality Day. On August 25th of 2016, President Obama proclaimed in part, today as we celebrate the anniversary of the hard-won achievements and pay tribute to the trailblazers and sufferers who moved us closer to a more just and prosperous future. 
we resolve to protect the constitutional rights and pledge to continue fighting for equality for women and girls. So when you look at a chronology, in 1920, we talked about the ratification. In 20, 1923, the first version of the Equal Rights Amendment is introduced, it says, men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States and every place subject to its jurisdictions. In 1932, Hattie Wyatt of Arkansas became the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate. In 1932, the National Recovery Act forbid more than one family member from holding a government job, <laughs> resulting in many women losing their jobs. In 1933, Frances Parkins became the first female cabinet member appointed by Secretary of Labor by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. In 1953, Jerry Cobbs is the first U.S. woman to undergo astronaut testing for NASA, however canceled the women's program in 1963. It was not until 1983 that an American woman got to, send, got, got to be sent into space. In 1963, the Equal Pay Act is passed by Congress promising equality wages for the same work, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex of the worker. In 1964, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act was passed prohibiting sex discrimination in employment. The Equal Opportunity Employment Commission is created. In 1965, the Supreme Court established the right of married couples to use contraception. In 1968, Lyndon B. Johnson signed an executive order prohibiting sex discrimination by government contractors and requiring affirmative action plans for hiring women. In 1969, California adopts the nation's first no-fault divorce law, allowing divorce by mutual consent. In 1972, Title IX of Education Amendment prohibited sex discrimination in all aspects of educational programs that serve federal support. The Supreme Court upholds the right to use birth controls by unmarried couples, also 72. 73, landmark, Supreme Court rules Roe v. Wade makes, adoption, makes abortion legal. The Supreme Court is a separate ruling banning sex segregation, help wanted, advising. 1974, housing discrimination based on sex and credit discrimination for women was outlawed by Congress. In 1975, the Supreme Court denied states the right to exclude women from juries. 1978, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act banned employment discrimination against pregnant women. 1980, Paula Hawkins of Florida, a Republican, became the first woman to be elected to the U.S. Senate without following her husband or father in the job. In 1981, Sandra Day O'Connor became the first woman to serve on the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled that excluding women from the draft of constitution was, is, un, is constitutional. In a separate decision, the High Court overturned state laws designating a husband, head, and master <laughs> with unilateral control of property owned jointly with his wife. In a breaking tradition, Lady Diane Spencer delegated the vow to obey her husband as she marries Prince Charles. 1983, the ERA falls short of ratification. 1983, Dr. Sally Ride becomes the first American woman to be sent into space. 1984, Geraldine Ferraro became the first woman to be nominated to be vice president of a major party ticket. The U.S. Supreme Court banned sex discrimination in membership for on-time all-male groups. The state of Mississippi relatedly ratifies the 19th Amendment granting women the right to vote. 1985, Emily List is founded the mission to elect democratic pro-abortion rights for women in office. 1986, 1986, the Supreme Court held that the work environment can be declared hostile or abusive because of discrimination based on sex, an important tool for sexual harassment cases. 1989, the Supreme Court affirmed the right of states to deny public funding for abortions and to prohibit public hospitals from performing abortions. 1992, the year of the woman. 
following 1991 hearing in which lawyer Anita Hill accused Supreme Court nominee Clarence Thomas of sexual harassment. Record numbers of women are elected to Congress, with four women winning Senate seats and two dozen women elected to the first time in the House. In Planned Parenthood, in Southeast Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania vices Casey, the Supreme Court rule upheld Roe vices Wade, but allowed states to impose restrictions such as waiting periods and parental consent for minors seeking abortion. 1994, the Violence Against Women Act funds services for victim of rape, domestic violence, and allows women to seek civil rights remedies in gender-related crimes. Six years later, the Supreme Court validates those portions of the law permitting victims of rape, domestic violence, etc., to sue their attackers in federal court. 1997, Madeleine Albright becomes the first female Secretary of State. 2005, Congress passes the Partial Birth Abortion Ban Act, the first law to ban specific abortion procedures. The Supreme Court upholds the ban the following year. 2007, Nancy Pelosi becomes the first female Speaker of the House. 2008, Alaskan Governor Sarah Palin becomes the first woman to run for Vice President on the Republican ticket. Hillary Clinton loses the Democratic nomination to Barack Obama. 2009, the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Act, restoration allowing victims, usually women, of paid discrimination to file a complaint with the, gov with the government against their employer within 180 days of their last paycheck. 2012, the Paycheck Fairness Act, meant to fight gender discrimination in the workplace, falls in the Senate on a party line vote. Two years later, Republicans filibuster the bill twice. 2013, the ban of women in military combat positions is removed, overturned, 1994 Pentagon decision restricting women from combat roles. 2016, Hillary Rodman Clinton secures the Democratic presidential nominee, becoming the first U.S. woman to lead the ticket in a major party. She loses the Republican Donald Trump in the fall. The Supreme Court strikes down oneness abortion clinics, regulations that were forcing women, women's clinics to close. 2017, Congress has a record number of women with 104 female House members, 21 senators, including Chambers' first Latino, Nevada Senator Catherine Cortez. In 2019, yet only a third of elected officials at the local, state, and federal level are women. 22 states have never had a woman for a governor. The nonprofit She Should Run was founded in 2011 by Erwin Luz Cortero after she noticed the lack of support for women interested in running for government. Today, the group has empowered tens of thousands of women to consider running for office, and it has ambitious goals in raising that number to 250,000 by 2030. The organization hosts an incubator program, which is online, and set, and set of courses and mentors. It also has an astrological success rate. 80% of the women reported feeling more confident about their path to run for office completing the training program. I read a caption uh, yesterday, so where are we today? Um, but Eleanor Roosevelt said that um, you can only feel inferior by giving your permission to allow somebody to make you feel that way. And that's probably so true. So when we listen to the history and all the things that we've kind of walked through just a little bit, where are we now? Even in the federal government, I took some of your numbers here, and women are not on equal footage with men. But I guess my message would be to any woman is that not so much to find out who else has what, but how can you obtain the things that you need to do? What is the path that you need to take to get you where you're going? I know that uh, discrimination exists in the workplace. I was a civil rights director for the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. 
I was the Deputy Civil Rights Director for the United States Department of Agriculture, 150,000 employees. You can probably show me a case that I didn't see in that Navy Yard, and certainly agriculture was not much better. But what I fear found out is that you need a plan. If you're going to make affect change, whether it's for you or whether it's for anybody else, you need a plan. A lot of times people come to work and they think, well, this is a nice office, this is a nice building, so I will stay here. A lot of times that's not your best recourse. First of all, you got to look at your obstacles. If you know that there's some things in place in our system that inherently will hold you back, you got to figure out how to navigate around those things. The first thing I'll tell anybody who's trying to get ahead is that you can't always stay in the same place. Sometimes you just can't do that. You got to be willing to move a little bit. You got to be willing to go where the opportunity is. Um, you need to prepare yourself. You, you need the education. You know, you, you have to understand the playing field. If you don't have the criteria to get things through your mere presence, then you have to do some things to augment what your talents are. Number one, you got to be the best. I don't care, clerk, typist, director, specialist, you've got to be the best. Because if you are the best at what you do, when all things are equal, you will get selected over the person that's okay. Now, if both of y'all are okay, and there's some discrimination going on, whether it's overt or, or, or not, then that person will get picked. But if you are the best, any manager who has a task to perform is going to get somebody that's going to make them shine. So you can't be on par or below because then people exercise their right to justify their behavior. You, you have to know that you can't do certain things that make it to the top because the person who's looking at you may not be at the top to pull you up. So there's no point in trying to kiss over here when this person has less than you do. If you want to kiss somebody, you better kiss an SES or a GS-15 if you're a GS-5. But no kissing no more fives. That, that's, that's not how it works. So what you got to do is figure out what do you need to do. When I started in the government back in 1967, actually I started in 65. I worked two years in high school in one of the, one of the programs for high school kids. And um, I started as a GS-2. And a three in six months. And usually at that time, for African Americans, it was not a secret. They tell you straight up, you're done. <laughs> you may get a four, but uh, that's going to be with prayer and hard work. And I did pray and I did work hard. Um, and I did get passed over like this many zillion times. But that's okay. Because when I got passed over over here, I went and found me another job over there. So I got me a four. So now, by now, I went to four agencies by now, and I'm only 19 years old. So then I said, well, all right, what do we have to do? You already told us that you're not going to move us, no matter who we are, because we are people of color. Okay, well, we do make an exception if you have the education. And we make the exception if you have mechanical skills. Well, y'all, I was never one for dirty hands, so forget the mechanical skills. And so I decided, well, I'll go to school. So I, I got riffed three times. And so the third time I decided to bag this jack. So I took a leave of absence and I went to school full time. So the first day of school, the school goes on strike. That's all right. I went out and helped them pick it. But I wasn't going back to that job because they gave me $100 and a book bag. So, you know, I wasn't giving that back. So anyway, uh, I, I went to school and I got me an associate's degree in administration of justice and a bachelor's degree in sociology specializing in criminology. So I came back to the government, and guess what they told me? Too much education. Wait a minute, I left because you said I didn't have enough. Now I'm back and I have too much. But we don't have anything in your area of expertise. Well, what you got? Oh, there's old clerk typist job over there. You want it? Got it, give it here. <laughs> I took it. And I spent every bit of my working hours filling out applications, like 50, 100, until somebody decided, well, I'll take you. So I got me a, another four. And then I got a five, and then I decided, well, I got to move on here, so what do I do? So I took another five in another organization, and so I didn't even, I wouldn't even go in for the interview. It didn't matter. Just, just give me the job. If you want me, I'm coming. I'm coming. Because, but my name was Neil at the time, see, so they thought I was somebody else. So when I showed up, <laughs> your name is Constance Neil? 
as he lies. <clears throat> and so uh, I worked there, and then I found out about a program, and you know, you do need mentors, and you do need sponsors, and the director, he kind of took a little liking to me as a, as a worker, you know, because I did the best I could with my little five job, and he told me one day, he says, um, I got a program for you, but meanwhile, I just gotten, I just got offered a seven. He said, but it was an OPM program, and if you want that program, you have to go back to five. Five? So I go, well, I don't, I don't know about that. Um, but I looked at the program. The program would allow me to become a classifier, employee relations, employee development, EEO, all of the disciplines. I, I run the gamut for a couple years until I get them all under my belt. So I took my little seven for one day and went back to the five. So then I became a seven. And then I got a nine. And then I got an 11. And meanwhile, I figured out how to go to school. So now I got a PhD because I'm going to, well, I got a master's degree in adult education and I was working in training. So what I did was I went to the commanding officer and said, look, if I do my dissertation and I give it to you, can I do it on the clock? He said, yeah, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to canvas your shipyard and show you how much sexual harassment is here. I was already a counselor for, for, the, for, for, for women. I was the women's program manager there, so he let me do that. And of course, I gave him the study because you know them boys down in the Navy, I was acting the fool, so we had plenty of stuff to give them. And, uh, so meanwhile, the, they said it was going to shut down the shipyard in Philadelphia. So the, and the admiral came to Philadelphia, and I had developed a job club program for them, a program that if we, we were going to shut that yard down, we took all of certain kinds of uh, mechanics or clerical folks. You come together every single week to talk about what we're going to do. They gave us a couple million dollars to help shut that shipyard down and do something with them 25,000 people. So when he came down and saw the program, he asked me would I go to Bethesda and build a program there. For what? So he said, so the director told me, she's not going to go there for a 12. The girl, she's a 12 with a PhD? Yeah, she's a 12 with a PhD. So he said, I'll give you a 13 if you come and go to Bethesda. Meanwhile, somebody at the Department of Agriculture found my little resume and asked me to come to build them a civil rights program in Washington. Now, I was a professor at Temple University. I always keep doing a whole lot of stuff, y'all. And so what I decided to do was go build a program for them. So they gave me a 13, and then a 14, and then a, I got a 15. And so then I became one of the candidates for the senior executive program, and that's how I ended up as an SES, and then I went to the department and became the deputy for the whole. Now, I share that with you because I want you to see that there's never a straight line to get where you're going. Never, ever, ever. So a lot of times you just gotta realize, what do I have in my hand? What are, what are my beans? And how do I use them? And what do I need to do to get where I'm going? I find somebody, and what I'm going to do is say, well, how did you get there, ma'am? How did you get there, sir? And so what path did you take? You know, somebody asked me one time, when I, when I got my PhD out of Temple University, I was the only African-American female in the, in, the, in, the, in the group, so they interviewed me for a newspaper. And they asked me, um, how did it feel being a PhD? Do I feel different? And I go, no, but people treat me different. People treat me with regard. When I came to Washington, and they gave me my little office and all. They put my, I told my name is Constance Bales, and they put it on the door. But I noticed that Dr. Hickey Snock and Dr. Knocky Knock over here, they had doctor on the door, and people was running around there, going, doctor, 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 doctor. So I ran over there and found my name tag, honey, and went and put it on the door, too. And I became doctor, 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 doctor. But I always thought about it that, you know, people would say, well, what are you doing in the GS7 job with this amount of education? Because one of these days, they're going to run out of dogs and cats and cousins and girlfriends and sister going to be standing right there ready to go. And so you got to get ready. I'll tell you something else, ladies. Ladies, we, we have a tendency to think that we can do it all, that we have to do it all, and we have to do it all by ourselves. And we usually are raised that way. But you don't have to do it all by yourself. You are not every woman, you are one. So if he want to change that diaper, and that's his baby too, you leave both of them over there, I don't care if he pin it this way or that way, it's their baby too. If he wants some chicken from Popeye's, we are not cook, we're not going to work and cook and take care of the diaper and all that stuff, you're one. The other thing you need to learn that everybody can use a mentor. Not a best friend, your best friend is over here from elementary school, somebody that's going to tell you the truth, somebody's going to tell you that that dress does not look well on you, it is too small. 
So when you go for an interview, you make sure you wear the right size dress. Do not come for the interview with holes in your stock and acting like they just, you just snagged them. No. Bring some extra stockings, put them in your bag. You want to look the part. You know, if you look like a duck and you quack like a duck, people will treat you like a duck. You look like a bum, you talk like a bum, they'll treat you like one. But you need a mentor. You need somebody to tell you what you need to be doing. You need to be able to be a little bit mobile. You need to be knowledgeable, too. You need to be knowledgeable. You need to listen to the news, not all day and all night. Pay attention. You should know, if anybody asks you about coronavirus, you should be able to say, it started, blah, 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 blah. It's been affected here, and what are you going to do? You need to know something. If somebody brings up a conversation, when I took the job in Washington in the Department of Agriculture, um, I had no idea what they did in agriculture. I thought everybody was a farmer. That's all I knew. But when I came to Washington, I deliberately decided to come. Instead of a telephone interview, I know my voice carries. So what you hear and what you see is usually very different. So I decided, no, no, I'll come to Washington on the train. <laughs> and I did. And because I know my way in personnel, I went to the personnel office. I found it. And I said, could y'all have a mission statement? They gave it to me. I went in the bathroom and sat on the toilet and read it. So when the director asked me, he says, well, what do you know about agriculture marketing service? I said, well, I understand that you are a user-free organization and you have 12 commodities and blah, 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 and tobacco and that. <laughs> I just read every word. I had to be prepared. You need to be prepared. If you go for an interview, you don't go in there and say, I don't know what you do. But anyway, I guess my message still remains is that when we talk about the history, and we talk about where we are now, I feel like the message needs to be for women that we need to, we, we need to unite, we need to support one another. If you got something bad to say about somebody, go home and say it. You don't need to say it in the workplace. Support one another. Now that doesn't mean I think we exclude men. That's not what I'm talking about. But we're talking about women today. We came here to talk about women today. So y'all bring me back on Men's Day and I'll talk about the men. But today we want to talk about the women and what you can do to try to get where you need to be. So I guess having said that, I just think that there's a lot of things out there. Um, get involved in politics. Before I came to Washington, I thought that voting didn't matter. I thought that your opinion didn't count. But when I came to Washington and started working for the Secretary of Agriculture, who works for the President of the United States, I found out one monkey can stop a show. Your opinion does count. You need to vote. And you don't need somebody to tell you to vote. You ought to have sense enough to go vote on your own. You need to pay attention to what's going on around you so that when it affects you. I belong to the National Association for Active and Retired Federal Employees. And to that end, I am the first African-American female to hold a position of president for the state of Virginia. That means I get to go on the Hill, I get to talk to politicians all about our benefits. When they shut us down a little while ago, I was the one to go up there and tell, you know, Senator Warner or whomever that this is unacceptable, this is how we feel. If you want us to support you, you want us to vote for you, then you need to think about what you're going to do differently about these things. You need to know that too. If somebody gives you an opportunity to write a letter, you need to say, usually they write it for you. So you need to say to yourself, I'm going to put my name on this too. Because this might be the one thing that will turn the tides for us as women and for anybody, to, for that matter. You need to stand up and be counted and be recognized. Women's suffrage paid a whole lot of homage for us to be where we are today. For us to stand up in front of this kind of people and this kind of audience. That was not by happenstance. Somebody paved the way. We stand on some shoulders and we owe it to those behind us. And we owe it to those in front of us to be the best that we can be to represent. Well, I say thank you, sorry I was late, and hopefully what I had to say will try to encourage you to do whatever it is you need to do. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Bales, for the history lesson. Uh, for sharing your personal uh, experience and for some uh, sound career advice. Mm -hmm. I also want to acknowledge her companion today, her husband, Dr. John Bales, who traveled with her to be here today. So thank you. So as we look um, at the history lesson that we uh, had today, uh, it, it may seem like a lot of facts and figures. But behind each of those was a commitment, determination, sacrifice, 
and perseverance and vision. People who saw that things could be different and chose to work to make that happen. Each fact or date represents a step along the journey, and it's a journey that we continue today. And the progress continues because of the actions we take right now. And so because of those behind every fact and figure, we're just every, I'm struck by it, it was just everyday people, people who made up their mind to work towards a goal. And so they made a decision to, again, to uh, expend that uh, energy and effort. And those everyday people today, that's us. And so whether you are forging a new frontier in some element, be it at work or in your community as a woman, whether you serve as a role model, uh, whether you support children, teens, and young adults, or encourage the dreams and successes of our youth, we're making history. And so let us be cognizant of that as we continue on. So as we conclude our program, again, I just again want to thank uh, Dr. Bales and her husband. So thank you again. Thanks to our uh, executive sponsor, the Federal Women's Group executive sponsor, Nancy O'Connor, for coming down from Philly today to be with us. The Federal Women's Group, their executive board, and the planning committee, and really all the partners who come together to make these events possible. So I also thank you for attending today. Um, hope that you uh, learned something. Hope that you uh, got some uh, good information. And hope that you were inspired to keep making history. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.